So um, dosing safety issues here, 70 milligrams, 140 milligrams. Uh, how do you do that? How do you determine the need? How do you work that? Well, um, the, uh, the regulatory guidance is that 70 milligrams is the dose and for some patients 140 milligrams will be useful. If you look at the clinical trials, about four out of five patients who are going to respond to a renumab will respond to 70 milligrams. Um, if you're a person who starts low, then you'll start at 70. If you're a person who likes to jump in the water and get wet, you might start, in a, start at 140. Personally, I think it's reasonable to start at 70 milligrams and, and, and move forward from there. These are parenterals? Uh, they're subcutaneous injection monthly. Monthly. So if you only have to get, it occurs to me that there's two possible outcomes for monthly injections. One is, great, I only need one injection a month. Yes. The other is, oops, I forgot my monthly injection because it's so infrequent. Uh, what's your experience with this? Um, how does it affect compliance? Well, the beauty of this is that the, the, these medicines is the effect is reasonably quick. Um, so if you happen, if you forget your injection, the headaches will come back and you take your injection and they'll settle down pretty quickly again. Um, most patients, I, I, and so far, I don't, so I don't think that's a, that's a huge problem because the effect comes on pretty quickly. And they're so well tolerated that it's business, you don't have to gradually approach the, the, the dose because they don't have cognitive problems, they don't have weight gain problems, you don't have hair loss, um, you don't have any of the problems we've been talking about. So they are, the, it's relatively easy, to, easy medicine to start and stop. And then what, it comes in either auto-injectors or pre-filled syringes? Yeah, auto-injectors. Is, is there a difference? I mean, does it make a difference? Oh, I think people prefer auto-injectors. I don't think most people like n injecting themselves, but I mean... The, the I, problem I'm with the auto-injector yeah. is that it contains latex. So people who have oh. a latex allergy appreciate having the other uh, option available. Can I, can I ask the pharmaceutical industry why? <laughs> Why would there be latex in an auto injector? Is, there's got to be a technical reason, right? I would guess. I mean, we're trying to make the entire healthcare delivery system latex free. Mm -hmm. So maybe some people will require the pre filled syringes, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's just easier uh, to administer the, the pre filled, um, the, the auto injector is easier to administer. All right, so let's, now that we've discussed all these older therapies, going all the way back to the ergots and moving forward. Which patients, which patients now are candidates for treatment with the anti-CGRP antibodies? Well, insurance companies um, help, help decide that. Um, for some insurance companies, they require um, a minimum of four uh, headache days or migraine days per month. And then having failed uh, three or more um, preventives plus uh, use of triptans. Okay. So is that because these drugs are ruinously expensive? They're pretty expensive, but I participated in the Institute for Clinical Review hearing, and uh, the people associated with ICER were pretty, I don't want to say pleasantly surprised, but they were surprised that the uh, price point of the drug came in as low as it did. All right, let's, let's stop dancing around this thing. Mm -hmm. How much do they cost? It's um, 570 uh, an injection. 570 dollars an injection. I will not trust my math again. But <laughs> 570 times 10 would be 5,700 dollars a year. Add another couple. Right, it's about I mean, eight, we're not 8, talking. A year. We're not talking 8,000. We're not talking about some of these the newer biologics, which are hundreds of thousands no. a year. No, I think that's why they were surprised. Yeah. I'm that, surprised. Yeah. And similar to Botox. It's similar to Botox, uh, which we've already discussed. So. Are you reserving this treatment now for patients who fail other preventive cares, or can we start these drugs because they work on treatment-naive patients? Why not just jump in, as you said, the deep end of the pool? Mm -hmm. oh, I didn't advocate jumping in the deep end of the pool. I, I, I offered it as an option. <laughs> I mean, I think it's, you know, I think it's not unreasonable to have some, um, what you call step is to have had some um, reasonable exposure to simple preventives to make it easier for people who don't respond to simple preventives to get these new medicines easier. I think there's a, there's a collaborative way of thinking about this. So personally, I'm, I'm perfectly okay with having um, step edits 
um, and then and then having this uh, this medicine available. Mm -hmm. right. right, because sometimes Topamax works yes. beautifully for works people well. or, or a beta blocker. Or, right. And there's right. a benefit for the patient yes. too of not having to come in for that injection yes. if they can monitor mm -hmm. manage it themselves. What, what are the side effects of the anti CGRP antibodies? Are there any? Yeah, what is the downside? Very minor um, constipation, rhinitis, um, injection site pain. But I mean, nothing to nothing, write home about, really. No, no. Unless there's it's because it's because it's such a large molecule. There's no liver toxicity uh, issue with the drug. So we're not talking about a downside here for patient toxicity. No. So all that we're really talking about in terms of starting with one of these drugs as opposed to something else is cost. Right? And if you can get away with something that's efficacious and cheaper, why not? Right? So, but there should be, if that's the only issue, there should be a rapid potential for right. escalation. Right. Is there? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's where I get back to the patient-physician relationship. Because what you don't want is somebody who fails one or two mm -hmm. and then goes away and just lives with this. So you want them to be educated on what the options are. You want someone kind of walking them through what the various options are from the provider side. And as a health plan, we have that responsibility, too, mm -hmm. to educate. Is this class of drugs more geared for patients with episodic migraines or for chronic migraines? Neither. It's, fair. it's, it's aimed at disabling migraine. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you've got, um, the, the, the line between episodic and chronic migraine is entirely artificial and is half of 30. That's the way the committee decided. I can tell you I was on the committee at the time when the decision was taken. So the, the idea that 14 days or 13 days a month is not horribly disabling is, is silly. Um, it seems to me that the question really for these medicines is who's disabled? This chronic episodic thing, I put the discussion down altogether, it's who's disabled and what have they had? And if they've had very reasonable exposures, and it, let's, let's talk about what the step edit should be, let, that's, a that's a discussion to have, then putting a line at 15 is that I, I really don't see a great arg logic in that, I have to say. So I, I think it's for people who are disabled who failed previous preventives right. at a reasonable number.